Good morning, everyone. If you could just give us just a few minutes, we're waiting for one more witness and we will begin shortly. Thank you.
If we could ask for uh, Mr. Joyner and Mr. Lopez to please come and take their seats. Again, good morning, everyone. Uh, our third panelist is on his way in, but we do need to, be, to begin. Uh, so the Subcommittee on Elections of the Committee on House Administration will come to order. I would like to thank the members of the subcommittee and my colleagues from the House who are here with us today, as well as our witnesses and all those in the audience for being here today. I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and that written statements be made part of the record. Hearing no objection, so ordered. I guess he's on his way in. Well, our third witness has arrived, so we'll let him take his seat. Good morning, my friend. Good morning again. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Butterfield, our witnesses, and the people of North Carolina for joining us here today. I want to thank my distinguished colleague again, Mr. Butterfield, for so warmly welcoming us to his district as we continue this important work. Congressman Butterfield has a long and exemplary record protecting the right to vote, and I am so grateful for the leadership he shows with our committee. 
We are here to examine the state of voting rights and election administration in North Carolina. I cannot think of a better place to continue our hearings to ensure that all Americans can exercise their right to vote. The right to vote is the core of what it means to participate in our democracy. The power of the ballot sets the direction for our communities, our families, and our lives. When the Supreme Court struck down a core provision of the Voting Rights Act in 2013, Chief Justice Roberts wrote nonetheless that, and I quote, voting discrimination still exists. No one doubts that, end quote. Two months later, legislators in North Carolina proved that point. They rushed through an omnibus piece of legislation known by many as the monster law that slashed a week of early voting, mandated an overly restrictive form of photo ID that African Americans disproportionately lack, eliminated same-day voter registration, ended the counting of out-of-precinct ballots, and eliminated pre-registration for 16 and 17-year-olds. Fortunately, that same day, when the governor's signature was barely dry, a group of North Carolinians sued, and they put in years of work. They organized, and they won. As we are likely to hear this morning, a unanimous three-judge panel for the Fourth Circuit found that the challenge provisions of the monster law were unconstitutional, a violation of the Fourth, 14th Amendment, and a violation of what remains of the Voting Rights Act. The Fourth Circuit found that the new provisions targeted African Americans, and again I quote, with almost surgical precision, and clearly enacted with discriminatory intent. And so those challenge provisions of the law were blocked. We have with us today people from North Carolina who are leaders, fighters, in the cause of justice. We are going to learn how much more we must do to ensure voting remains free and fair in North Carolina. This hearing and the others we are holding will help as Congress, will help as Congress of the United States examines what must be done to ensure every eligible American can vote and have that vote counted. I would now yield to my colleague, Mr. Butterfield, for his opening remarks. Let me thank you, Congresswoman Marcia Fudge, for your friendship, and thank you for your leadership, and thank you certainly for your willingness to bring this field hearing to Northeast and North Carolina. Uh, when uh, we first had the conversation about the location for this hearing, I told uh, Marcia that my preference was Halifax County, uh, because it's a very uh, dear county to me, but uh, in the interest of convenience, uh, since Raleigh-Durham was pretty close to the airport, it may be nice to have it at the NCCU School of Law. And so I gave her the option of those two locations, and she emphatically said, we need to go to Halifax County, North Carolina. And so thank you, thank you so much for, for your willingness to bring this hearing to, to this location. And thank you to the panelists for your willingness to share your valuable testimony today that will weigh heavily uh, in future legislation to protect the right to vote. Now, I know my colleagues are laser focused on the developments in Washington today as the Mueller report is making available, uh, being made available to the Congress and to the public. Immediately following this field hearing, I will quickly, and I'm sure other members will as well, obtain a copy of the report and read it from cover to cover. Attorney General Barr has a solemn obligation as Attorney General to provide the American people with definitive answers about the President's conduct and whether President Donald Trump violated the trust that the American people have reposed in him. This report today contains the answers the American people deserve to see. Madam Chair, Halifax County is a significant portion of my congressional district. Uh, as a Superior Court judge for some 15 years, I held dozens of weeks of court in this county. In fact, my last week presiding uh, before going to Washington was in this county. Uh, my relationship with Halifax dates back for many, many years. My mother and her sister uh, taught at the Rosenwald School here. Uh, her brother, my uncle, was the principal of the Weldon Graded School, which is right down the street. Uh, my uncle, my dear uncle, was pastor here for 64 long years. And so as a young lawyer, I found myself entangled in dozens of cases in this county, including representation of Mr. Horace Johnson, in the Section 2 case of Johnson versus County of Halifax, which dismantled at-large commissioner districts and resulted in the creation of districts that have now elected 
four African American commissioners out of seven, one of which is here today, the chairman of the Board of Commissioners, Mr. Vernon Bryan. Uh, I might add that the NAACP Legal Defense Fund was the lead counsel in the case. I did not have the resources, uh, was the lead counsel in the case and provided all of the resources. I'm proud of Halifax County. I'm proud to be their representative and I, I'm proud to have this hearing today. Uh, finally, uh, Madam Chair, when slavery ended, uh, there were 10,300 slaves here in Halifax County. Uh, almost 7,000 slaves live across, lived across the river in Northampton County. The former slaves became registered voters. They elected African Americans to the legislature from this county, they elected African Americans to the Board of Commissioners, and in 1882, an African American was elected to Congress from this county who served for two terms. His name was James Edward O'Hara from the town of Enfield. The ability to vote was taken away from African Americans in 1900 with the passage of the literacy test. The literacy test was nullified by the enactment of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And I might add very briefly that part of the legislative record for the Voting Rights Act emanated from Northampton County right across the river. A lady named Louise Lassiter from Seaboard presented herself to register to vote in that county, was denied the right to register because she could not read nor write. Uh, she retained an attorney from Weldon here, his name was James Walker. Uh, Walker retained Sam Mitchell, who was a black lawyer from Raleigh. Uh, those, uh, those two lawyers litigated the case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, challenging the literacy test. Though they lost that case, uh, it laid the legislative record that was used for the enactment of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And so hearings like this uh, are critically important in the legislative process. Since 1965, black citizens in this county have become politically active, but there continue to be obstacles that remain, which I am sure the witnesses will discuss today. Most notable is the fact that only one, one early voting site serves this entire county. Halifax County is a persistent poverty county with a poverty rate of 28%, with one of eight households without transportation. And so, Madam Chair, this hearing is very important as we prepare to take up legislation to guarantee the unfettered right to vote to every American. We are determined, yes we are, we are determined to fix Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, hopefully with bipartisan support, uh, which was invalidated by the court. Prior to the Supreme Court decision, 40 counties in North Carolina and the, and the state legislature were required to submit voting changes to the Department of Justice for preclearance, thus preventing discriminatory changes in election law and procedure. Not having the benefit now of Section 5, affected communities must now resort to very expensive litigation or suffer the effects of the discriminatory voting change. This subcommittee must build a record to provide the legislative basis for the passage of strong voting rights protections and amending Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act to meet the concerns of the Supreme Court. I want to thank you, Madam Chair, for your time. Thank you for your friendship, and I'm prepared to, to hear from these witnesses. Thank you very much, Mr. Butterfield. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our witnesses for today. Uh, first, we have Professor Irving Joyner, Professor of Law at North Carolina Central University School of Law, a leader in this state on the cause of voting rights, the rule of law, and the Constitution. Mr. Tomas Lopez, uh, a leader with Democracy North Carolina, whose organization is on the front lines of protecting the right to vote. And last but not least, Dr. Reverend Barber, who is my good friend, thank you, nice to see you, sir, president and senior <laughs> lecturer with Repairs of the Breach, whose moral leadership and activism has inspired generations of people in this state to push back against North Carolina's voter suppression and so much more. Mr. Joyner, we will begin with you. You will have five minutes. There's a lighting system when the light turns green. Uh, obviously, that means go. When it turns yellow, you'll have about a minute left. And when it turns red, I'd ask for you to try to close. Thank you, sir. You are recognized. Thank you for uh, this opportunity to appear before you, uh, Chairman Fudge, Congressman uh, Butterfield. Uh, I want to thank you for coming here uh, and uh, giving me the opportunity to come to Halifax County again. Uh, one to stop in Halifax County 
uh, for this purpose uh, rather than just driving through it uh, on my way to, uh, to D.C. Uh, I think, though, in a, uh, uh, well, let me just introduce myself. You introduced me. Uh, I'm a professor at North Carolina Central University School of Law. I chair the uh, North Carolina uh, NAACP Legal Redress uh, Committee, and I've served as its uh, legal counsel and uh, have engaged in research in this uh, voting rights uh, area as well as uh, engaged in litigation of uh, voting rights uh, issues uh, here in, uh, in the state. Uh, as a people, the most important right that we have is the right to vote. It is, uh, it is beyond dispute that voting is of the most fundamental significance under our constitutional structure. Other rights, even the most basic, are illusory if the right to vote is uh, undermined. I have uh, submitted a uh, statement uh, to, the, uh, to this panel already along with a law review article uh, that I uh, prepared a couple of years ago for the Duke Journal of Constitutional Law and Public Policy, which discusses much of the uh, history uh, dealing with uh, voting rights in, uh, in North Carolina. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of uh, scan through that since I only have uh, five minutes. Up until 1835, uh, free Africans in this state could vote uh, as a uh, matter of law. And they could vote up until the time that the uh, General Assembly made a decision that they were going to disenfranchise uh, those free Africans from voting, the free Africans who owned property, uh, in the state who qualified otherwise as uh, voters uh, could vote and there was a decision made by members of the General Assembly that they did not want African Americans at that time uh, to vote because they feared uh, what they called Negro domination. Uh, even though no uh, records does not indicate that any African American had been elected to any office, the mere fact that they were voting was just too much for members of the uh, General Assembly who uh, adopted the notion and later uh, confirmed in Dred Scott uh, decision that uh, this American democracy uh, and its founders never intended that uh, people of color uh, would uh, be citizens or would be able to vote. So there was an intentional decision made at that time to disenfranchise uh, African Americans. Um, Representative uh, Butterfield has already talked about uh, the uh, uh, reconstruction uh, governments in which African Americans uh, could uh, vote uh, following 1868 uh, with the uh, development of, uh, of a new constitution in North Carolina uh, led by Abraham uh, Galloway and others. Uh, the right to vote was enshrined in the North Carolina Constitution given to uh, African Americans the right to participate on equal grounds with whites in the vote. And from 1868 until 1898, uh, that right was observed, although there was a lot of violence, uh, a lot of pressure and harassment directed toward uh, those African Americans who could vote. 90% of our community registered and regularly participated in the process up until that time. And in 1898, uh, the General Assembly uh, made decisions to intentionally disenfranchise those individuals from the uh, right uh, to vote. Uh, the literacy tests, poll taxes, and a number of other devices were put in place that took away from African Americans deliberately and intentionally uh, because they wanted to avoid the uh, possibility of what was then described as Negro domination of whites where African Americans would be lording over, uh, over whites. So there was a, an intentional decision made at that time. Uh, in 1947, Kenneth Williams, Reverend Kenneth Williams in Winston-Salem became the first African American to be elected to a city council position in, uh, in, that, uh, in that city. Uh, it was a single member district in which an African American ran against a uh, white and for the first time in history, uh, African Americans were able to uh, elect 
uh, a member of their own. And uh, after that, there was an intentional decision to um, uh, get rid of the uh, right to vote by multi-member districts and at large campaigns that Representative Butterfield uh, spoke to. I'm going to stop. My time uh, is, uh, is up, and uh, I'll be uh, available to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. We will have questions after all of the panelists uh, speak. Mr. Lopez, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Butterfield, thank you for being here and for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Tomas Lopez, and I am the Executive Director of Democracy North Carolina. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that works to, among other goals, protect the right to vote in this state. And as part of this work, we seek to bring North Carolinians, especially historically underrepresented people of color, into the political process and encourage their participation through and leadership through voting, elections monitoring, and issue advocacy. Uh, we also advocate for policies and practices that we believe will increase voter access and uh, participation, author original research on election administration, and help coordinate a statewide nonpartisan poll monitoring and voter assistance, assistance network that staffed one in 10 North Carolina polling places in 2018. Uh, prior to my role here, I was a voting rights attorney at the Brennan Center for Justice, where I litigated uh, voting rights cases in the federal courts, uh, contributed to original research on election issues, and supported uh, state-level election reform efforts. Uh, I, my written testimony speaks to a consistent, uh, concerted, years-long effort to limit voter participation and impact in North Carolina for the sake of short-term political advantage. That includes things like the 2013 Monster Law. Uh, I want to focus my comments here on a more recent development, and that's the impact of efforts to revive elements of the 2013 law namely through a uh, revived photo ID requirement and through re recent reductions to early voting. Uh, as to the ID requirement, uh, last year in 2018, the North Carolina General Assembly placed onto the ballot a uh, measure that requires photo ID in order to vote. It was broadly worded, uh, did not provide specifics as to what kind of ID would be required, and no word of what kind of ID would be required was provided prior to uh, the referendum in which it was put into place. Uh, following that election, but prior to the seating of a new General Assembly, uh, where there was no longer a supermajority, the legislators put in place a ID requirement that looks very similar in wording to the original law from 2013 that was overturned in 2016. Uh, key difference in that law, or at least a surface level difference in that law, is that this New law provides for uh, the use of student and employee, employee IDs for voting. Uh, the problem that has been emerging in practice is that while the law says that you can use student IDs to vote, uh, what we've seen is that, uh, as written, the law requires universities, colleges, and community colleges to attest under penalty of perjury as to citizenship verification, uh, imposes administrative challenges that have discouraged campuses from applying, and uh, has led to a situation where there are a total of 37 community colleges, colleges, and universities out of over 100 eligible institutions that have even applied to get their, uh, to get their student IDs to be usable uh, in 2020. And of those, 11 campuses were denied, including uh, the 10 constituent universities of the University of North Carolina system, which include the flagship in Chapel Hill and one historically black college. Uh, the General Assembly is considering legislation that would uh, modify these requirements, including by uh, lifting the attestation requirement that measure passed the State House, but uh, it's unclear what will happen with it in the Senate. Uh, the second issue I want to raise is early voting. Uh, last year in June, the legislature passed a law, uh, S-325, that requires counties to stage early voting for the same hours across all sites. And while uniformity presents theoretical benefits, it has in practice reduced the availability of early voting. Uh, see, what happened in the past was counties, especially in low-resourced areas, uh, made early voting available at different times across a variety of locations during the early voting window. Uh, but the 2018 law makes this impossible uh, by requiring counties uh, that are early voting sites to be open for the same amount of hours if they are open during the week. And so what that's ha what's happened is that the most popular way to cast a ballot in North Carolina, which is before Election Day, the early voting, is less available. So we have 43 counties reducing the number of early voting sites in 2018 compared to the last midterm, 51 that have reduced the number of weekend days offered, 67 that have reduced the number of weekend hours, 
in eight counties where a majority of voters are black, four have reduced sites, seven have reduced weekend days, and all eight reduced the number of weekend hours during early voting, and none saw increases in sites and early or weekend options. Now this map up here shows Halifax County. In 2012, 2014, and 2016, there were three early voting sites here in Roanoke Rapids, Halifax, and Scotland Neck. Uh, after 2018 law required, early, required this uniformity, we're left just with an early voting site in Halifax. Uh, last year's election, uh, midterm election, had very high turnout. Uh, it was uh, across the state, across all demographic groups, dramatic increases. There were only three counties that actually had reduced turnout. Two were counties that were directly affected by Hurricane Florence in pretty dramatic ways, and the other was Halifax County. The, uh, you know, we, we see as a whole the cumulative effects, and I realize my, my time is running here. Uh, the experience in North Carolina across these issues and, and the set of things that we'll be talking about this morning speak for Congress to do two things. Uh, first is to restore the full protections of the Voting Rights Act in a way that's responsive to the way in which voting discrimination happens today. And the second is to ensure, uh, like legislation like H.R. 1, to ensure that government is playing the role that it should be in facilitating real participation in the political process. Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend Barber, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and to Congressman Butterfield as well. That the word for um, vote and voice in Hebrew is the same word. And here we are in Holy Week, and it says, Jesus said in Holy Week, no matter what else we do, if we do not attend to justice, we have left undone the weightier matters of the law. Uh, I'm also a um, member of the National Board of the NAACP, and and President Emeritus of the North Carolina NAACP, and we must have a full restoration of the Voting Rights Act in this country. Here in North Carolina, we have spent the better part of a decade defending our state against an all-out attack, an all-out attack on voting rights. In 2008, North Carolina's 15 electoral college votes went to America's first black president, and it sent shockwaves through a racially polarized, white-dominated Republican Party that had, since the time of Nixon, banked on winning elections in the South through uh, campaign strategies that stoked racial tensions and suppressed the vote. When this Southern strategy failed to deliver in 2008 and was instead defeated by a multiracial, fuse, multiracial fusion coalition in North Carolina, right-wing extremists scrambled to invest unprecedented sums of money in state legislative races, resulting in an extremist takeover in 2010. The governor would veto an attempt to put in place um, a photo ID in two 2010, but could not veto the racist redistricting maps that were put in place. The majority put them in place, redrew both the state legislative districts and the U.S. congressional districts in their favor. This, would lead, this was an act that was coordinated by the former speaker, now, Senator Tom Tillis uh, and a host of other regressive lawyers uh, led by um, Thomas Farr. When they made, that, uh, made that super, that, um, those new maps, it allowed for a supermajority to be elected in 2012. This supermajority, when elected in 2013, immediately, immediately began to introduce legislation and voting options that would, that, and to block voting policies that would block the expansion of the electorate that we had fought so hard for. It would take us eight years, eight years to overturn this, this, these efforts, eight years to overturn what the super, this supermajority that was in place because of sweeping unconstitutional racial gerrymandering. In 2013, they passed the Senate Bill 666 during this very week, holy whole week, 666. It was the worst attack on voting rights we'd seen since Jim Crow. Then they tabled it, and they waited. They waited until June 25, 2013, when the Supreme Court gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act. And our lead, some of the leadership in this state said, now that the headache has been removed, we can move forward. Immediately, just hours after the Shelby ruling was handed down, the leadership then of the North Carolina General Assembly announced that because of the headache has been removed, they would move forward now with the monster voter suppression law, the monster voter suppression law. Uh, that law was passed, and as, as you said before the ink was dry, 
we filed suit in the North Carolina NAACP with others, but this law sought to eliminate same-day registration, pre-registration for 16 and 17-year-olds, out-of-precinct ballot the first week of early voting, and instituted one of the nation's most stringent voter ID requirements. And we have been battling for 2,023 days today, five years, nine months, and 24 days since the Voting Rights Act was gutted in 2013. This monster voter suppression law was the worst of its kind after Shelby in the nation, and it was only possible because of the pre-clearance protection was no longer in place. It, in fact, has been the worst we have seen since Jim Crow. We heard the lawyer who was leading the effort say in court that retrogression was okay now that the Voting Rights Act was no longer in place. We heard a federal judge ask, it is on the record, why don't people want people to vote in North Carolina? In response to this, thousands, thousands were arrested, thousands marched of every race, color, creed, and party. Without the voting rights preclearance, it took us years of organizing and fighting. And finally, in July 2016, a unanimous panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals, the Fourth Circuit, held that the law that targeted African Americans with almost surgical precision uh, was, in fact, unconstitutional. However, they have not stopped. Even in 2008, there is a continuing effort to suppress the vote, to put in place in the Constitution uh, voter suppression through photo ID. We must have a restoration of the Voting Rights Act in this country. It is, in fact, continuing to undermine the very power that now African Americans, whites, and brown people have, particularly in the South, that could, could, could open up this, the politics of this country. The Southern strategy is still being worked through all of these efforts to suppress the vote at the very time that we have more power and potential than we've ever had in history. Thank you, and thank you all. We are now going to open up for questions, and I'm going to recognize my colleague, Mr. Butterfield, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, let me first address my uh, initial question to Professor Joyner. Uh, Mr. Joyner, thank you for your testimony today. You have been on the, on the front lines in this day for a very long time, and I just want to thank you and those that work with you and beside you for all the work that, that you do. Uh, you mentioned Dr. Kenneth Williams in Winston-Salem who became the first African-American alderman in North Carolina in 1947. You're absolutely right about that. And as a result of that, Winston-Salem went from district elections, I believe, to at-large elections. Uh, the next uh, African-American elected was in Fayetteville, Cumberland County. Same thing happened. Third was in Durham, and the fourth was in my hometown of Wilson, North Carolina. Uh, after uh, the African-American candidate won in Wilson in 1953, uh, in 1957, the city changed without notice, uh, changed the method of election from district elections to at-large elections, and the African-American candidate uh, lost miserably in, in 1957. I remember it so well. I was 10 years old, and I have the same name as the candidate who lost, the, lost that election. But the, the, but the question that I, I raise is, uh, is it critical to minority communities to have district elections? Is there a... a a benefit is, is, is there a leveling of the playing field when you have fairly drawn election districts? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, uh, because what happened and what happened with, uh, with your father and, and Wilson, Kenneth Wilson Williams and uh, Winston-Salem was that large populations of African Americans were submerged into larger white uh, populations and uh, prevented uh, individuals from being able able to be elected because they you had uh, race based uh, voting that was occurring at uh, at that time, sure. uh, but following up with that was uh, the strategy adopted then by African Americans to uh, single shot or bullet ballots uh, in order to overcome the uh, disadvantage of being submerged, and then the uh, legislature then outlawed that. Uh, made it illegal for you to uh, single shot. We are notorious for cutting off witnesses, so please don't take this personal, but uh, <laughs> the five minutes go pretty fast. Uh, the, the next question, do, do at-large elections still exist? Do, do you still encounter at-large elections, or are they a relic of the past? 
Uh, they, they, they are not a relic of, of the past. They are still present and they're coming back. And, and in those jurisdictions, do you find African-American communities and other minority communities submerged in these at-large systems and, and their votes are diluted? Yes, that is correct. And do these jurisdictions every 10 years redistrict as they're supposed to, according to law? The uh, smaller districts uh, typically do not. Uh, but uh, on, on the state level, they uh, redistrict, but typically at the uh, smaller level. City Council, County City Commission, Council, Board of County, Education. Yeah, they, they, they don't. All right. Uh, Mr. Lopez, uh, as I have a uh, little time left, uh, let me again thank you for, for your testimony as, as well. Um, you mentioned uh, Halifax County as, as an example uh, of, an, uh, of a county that has only one early voting site in the whole county. Uh, I've been coming to Halifax County for more than 50 years, and I can tell you firsthand, this is a large county. Uh, it stretches from Littleton on the west end to Scotland Neck on the east end. That's a long ways. Uh, and a substantial number of households do not have transportation. And to have only one early voting site in the county, do you find that to be problematic? It's deeply problematic, sir. I have a statement, Madam Chair, from the chairman of the, of the Halifax County Board of Elections. Uh, her name is uh, Kristen R. Scott, Elections Director. I have a record that I would uh, offer for the record that um, explains the difficulties uh, encountered by her office in funding multiple locations of early voting. Uh, without objection, uh, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, you mentioned voter ID, uh, Mr. Lopez. Um, I believe the original voter ID law passed by the legislature was struck down by the court. Yes. Which court struck that down? That was the uh, United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. That's a federal court? Yes, sir. All right. And then I believe the legislature came back uh, sometimes later and adopted a constitutional amendment to, with, and that proposition was placed on the statewide ballot. Is that correct? Yes. And then that constitutional amendment was struck down by which court? There was a state court in North, in North Carolina that, uh, that struck down the amendment that said uh, basically that because the, uh, the legislature that passed it uh, was unlawfully constituted per a federal court decision as to gerrymandering, that uh, really this violated North Carolinian constitutional principles as to uh, its authority to actually pass amendments. And finally, is it true that the legislature is of the opinion that they can still continue with the voter ID law uh, because of the enabling legislation, notwithstanding the uh, unconstitutionality of the, uh, of the uh, amendment? That is my understanding, and my understanding is that they are also appealing the, the, uh, the state court decision. So unless something changes, we will have voter ID in 2020. Yes, and, and I would say in addition to the, the actual amendment legislation, the enabling legislation is also being litigated. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Let me just ask each of you, uh, is, if there was two things that you would say that the federal government needs to do to assist you in your efforts to make sure that North Carolinians are treated fairly, uh, that we can once again give some confidence back to the people that we are doing all we can to be sure that everyone has the right to vote. What would those couple of things be? And we'll just start with you, Professor Jordan, and just go straight across. Well, I want to adopt everything that's been said already about uh, the uh, Voting Rights Act and its importance. <laughs> uh, what I would add to that is that we need to have uh, an independent voter protection agency uh, as a part of the uh, federal government uh, to uh, regulate and oversee efforts to guarantee that this fundamental right uh, is, uh, is honored. Uh, voting is a fundamental right, and it is just as fundamental as is uh, uh, communications, as is uh, election uh, financing, and there are independent agencies at the federal level to oversee that. Uh, we have lost faith in the uh, Justice Department to protect uh, our rights, so therefore we need something more permanent than that, and it ought to be in the form of an independent uh, agency with the uh, authority and power to uh, oversee and regulate voting. Okay, so then you would not uh, support the position that the Department of Justice should still do preclearance? I would not, personally, in light of uh, 
egregious decisions that's been made by that agency in, in, pre, in, uh, in the past years. Okay. Mr. Lopez. As I stated earlier, I think Congress, uh, by restoring the full protections of the Voting Rights Act with a coverage formula that was able to account for uh, the kinds of voting discrimination that we see today, and so that you know, it addresses a range of states. Uh, Madam Chair, you're from Ohio. That's a state that has a number of major issues involving voting rights, uh, and one that recognizes also the, na the changing nature of the country. Uh, North Carolina's uh, citizen voting age population increased uh, by 7.1 percent between 2012 and 2017, and Spanish limited English, but Spanish language limited English proficient citizens, that population increased by about 40 percent in that time. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the, the nature of uh, who is living and who is voting and who are, who are eligible voters is changing uh, in this state and around the country, and so language access is going to be an important piece of that picture as well, among the many other things that we're talking about here. Well, well, certainly one of the things that these hearings across the country are attempting to do is to create the very record that you're talking about so that we can have a formula that would satisfy not only the Supreme Court, but the Congress of the United States. So any data that you may have, you know, clearly, and, and I'll just read this now, um, that the record is going to remain open for at least five business days for additional materials. So if you have materials, we would very much love for you to submit them. Um, and we will take it, look at them and, and decide whether they should be a part of our uh, permanent record. Uh, Reverend Barber. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, I, I think we should fully restore and expand the Voting Rights Act, looking at the dynamics today. You know, 40% of the population in the South is now people of color, um, and we should fully expand it. Uh, I think that we have to be very careful when I hear people wanting to make this about partisanism and keeping it where it is about race. Ultimately, voter suppression is racist voter suppression. That has always been, and that's what we continue to see. The court said here in North Carolina, it was with surgical precision regarding race. Um, I think we also, and I'd like to submit some additional things, but also issues like automatic voter registration at 18, if you can be registered for war at 18 automatically, you should be registered to vote uh, automatically uh, at, at 18 to expand um, the vote. We should be looking at ways we can expand and more institutionalize early voting. Uh, all of those things that allow more participation. I'm haunted by that question the federal judge asks. Why is it that people don't want people to vote? And I would hope you would pull that from that federal, he would ask it in court, it's in the record. Um, lastly, and I don't know how we deal with this, but beyond just restricting the right to vote, what we have had in, in North Carolina and in other places is an unconstitutionally constituted legislature then blocking the people of North Carolina from benefits like Medicaid expansion, like living wages, and then an unconstitutionally constituted legislature once they lose in the federal court and lose in the state court turn around and, and put things in the Constitution. And somewhere that is very troubling, that you can be elected by procedures that the courts say is unconstitutional, but use your unconstitutional ill-gotten power to then implement policies that affect people from their voting rights to their wages to how we address poverty to women's rights to immigrants' rights. That is, that is if, it's not un, if it's not wrong legally, it's certainly uh, 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 wrong morally, and I believe it is a fundamental undermining of democracy for those who have been unconstitutionally elected to then have the power to affect the lives of the people in every aspect and form of their daily lives. As we conclude, let me just, just use this last minute to again thank the three of you for your testimony. It's been very valuable. And I just want to reassure you, we were in North Dakota two days ago in, in Bismarck, North Dakota on an Indian reservation. And uh, one of the witnesses there was very concerned that this would be an exercise in futility, that we were just politicians coming down just to, to check it off of a list. But I want to assure you that your testimony today uh, will be in the official congressional record we are the Elections Committee for the United States House of Representatives, and what you have said today will benefit us greatly. Uh, we are having seven 
field hearings across the country. We've already been to Brownsville, Texas, and Atlanta, Georgia. This week we're in North Dakota. Next, of course, we're here today. Next week we're in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. I don't know how we got to Cleveland, Madam Chair, but uh, that's, the, that's the chair's hometown. And then we traverse down to uh, Birmingham, Alabama, and then we conclude in Broward County, Florida. And so I just want to use my last minute just to assure you that this is just not a political exercise. Uh, this is the real deal, and it's creating the official record uh, that will be used to legislate on voting rights in the United States Congress. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Let, let me just ask this, this one last question. Um, and I think you all have touched on it, but how do segregation and poverty create uh, a, an additional barrier to voting, especially in places like Halifax County? It just goes right down the line. You start, please, Professor Joyner. Well, among other things, it, uh, it erodes the trust uh, uh, that people have in the uh, process and in the system. Uh, it erodes the uh, belief that the system is serving them fairly and serving them well and is looking out for their uh, best interest. Uh, the system has been uh, created in such a way that people are locked into a series of uh, deprivations and uh, with that they lose faith and trust uh, in the system, therefore they're not willing to participate uh, uh, actively in making sure that the system works. Mr. Lopez. In, in some sense, democracy is a deal, uh, that in exchange for your participation, your engagement, uh, your needs are addressed. And uh, where people see their needs not being addressed, uh, they don't see the value in participating, as, as Professor Joyner stated. I would also say that it also makes alternatives to democracy and alternatives to participation more appealing so that when uh, you're told that you know, the answer doesn't have to come from voting in this way, the answer doesn't have to come through uh, you know, certain kinds of solutions, uh, you're, you may be uh, more open to that. Uh, I would also say that there's uh, a certain, there are clearly ways in which these laws have been structured uh, to take it to place barriers that are especially difficult to surmount for people who have these things that they're dealing with. And, and so that's why transportation access, food access, the ability to uh, be a member participating in the economy are all things that actually do matter as democracy issues. Thank you, Dr. Barber. Yes, Madam Chairman. There was a concept that we used in um, our fight called an impoverished democracy. And that impoverished democracy says that when you put in, when you deny things like early voting, that we fought for years to put in place, finally won expansions in 2007 before the 2008 election, that you are undermining people <laughs> who every day of their lives have to fight just to exist and may not be able to be off on election day. We actually believe election day ought to be a holiday. And they can't, but early voting allows them, Saturday voting, to take, to get there. When they don't have that, that's a form of an impoverished democracy. Photo ID, when you make people as, as um, uh, God rest her soul, um, uh, our dear plaintiff, Rosanelle Eaton, before she died, she in testified and it was on the record of how many miles she had to travel and gas she had to spend. And she had voted for years, 50, 60 years. But under the new law, it prohibited her. She had to try to get this new ID. Um, that's a form of poll taxing in the 21st century. But here's the other piece of it. We in the Poor People's Campaign, the National Call for Moral Revival, have done a mapping. And that mapping is we mapped every state that has got engaged in racist voter suppression, particularly since 2013. And we then overlaid that map with poverty. And this is what we found. And I can introduce this into the record, that every state that has massive racist voter suppression law elects politicians who are adversely against the poor. And so the same states that have racist voter suppression laws have the highest poverty, the highest child poverty, the highest women in poverty, the, the most adamant uh, politicians against living wages. They all blocked Medicaid expansion. They all have policies that hurt women, the LGBT community, and immigrants. And ironically, the states that have the worst voter suppression elect politicians 
who end up passing policies that hurt mostly white people because the majority of the poor are white in terms of raw numbers, even though the majority of poor per capita are black. So in this state, there are almost two million poor and low-wealth people. There are 140 million poor and low-wealth people in this country. And all of the states that have voter suppression have the worst policies to, to, towards the poor. So if you only knew that a state had racist voter suppression, you could hypothesize that that state is backwards when it comes to living wages, health care, workers' rights, labor's rights, protection of the immigrant community, protection of the LBGQ community. So voting rights targeted, voter suppression targeted at black people ends up hurting all people because it is fundamentally against democracy. Thank you. Go ahead. Ma Madam Chair, I introduced into the record a statement of Kristen Scott, Elections Director for the County of Halifax. What I failed to do was to also enter into the record a map of Halifax County showing, and I have it on the screen now, uh, showing the contours of the entire county with the single early voting site being in Halifax, which is in the center of the county, which is uh, many, many miles from the other communities. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, no objection. So ordered. Thank you. Let me just uh, close by saying a couple of things. Uh, clearly, we know that um, our neighborhoods and our sc schools are probably as segregated now as they were in 1968. What we know that um, people of color in this country have been singled out for precisely the kind of voter suppression that we are talking about here today. Now, we have colleagues who believe that there is fraud in this country in voting. But the woman you're talking about who voted for 50, 60 years and then all of a sudden she couldn't vote anymore, to me that is, it's an abomination to who we are as a nation. Um, we are here to be sure that we can create the kind of a record that is going to be satisfactory to at least get a formula back in place. Because if we don't, it will get worse, it will not get better. Uh, as an African American, I know what it means to be an African American. Uh, and I understand that it's hard to be black in America today. <laughs> But I also know that it is hard to be poor in America today. It is hard to be a woman in America today. So we all have to come together to be sure that we can make America live up to her promise, uh, that all of us have the unabridged, unfettered right to vote. And I thank you for being here today to talk about what it is you think we need to do, because there is much we need to do. We cannot change people's attitudes, but we clearly can change the law. So I thank you all so much for being here, and I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much. If the panelists can just stay right here, we're going to walk around and take a photograph, and then as we prepare to bring our second panel up. Thank you. Is this congressional water? <laughs> water. I'm going to take a bottle of it if it is. Ladies and gentlemen, the second panel will convene in three minutes. The second panel in three minutes.
If our second panel would please take their seats. No, that's fine. I was going to say, uh, come here one second. Good, 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 good. What was her problem? What was her problem? She's taking whatever I said. Right, and that's why I inserted myself. And I okay. No, no, you should have. Because I wanted to remind you, but I want to tell you that this is an official congressional hearing and what the subject matter was, so that no one, if she doesn't cut it out, they'll understand why you put me in. Well, she's not, if she puts Thank you all so much. Uh, let us begin our second panel. So if you can uh, either take your seats or take your conversations out of the area, we'd like to begin. Yeah. Thank you so much. It is now time for our second panel. Let me begin by introducing Senator Dan Blue, who is a member of the North Carolina Senate where he serves as the chamber's minority leader. He also previously served as Speaker of the House in North Carolina and is a tireless leader in this state. Welcome. Uh, Caitlin Swain is co-director of Forward Justice. Ms. Swain has litigated challenges to North Carolina's voting laws and works at the intersection of law, policy, and civil rights in the South. And last but not least, Justice Patricia Timmons Goodson, Vice Chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Justice Timmons Goodson was more recently, was most recently an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of North Carolina from 2006 to 2012. And before that was an Associate Judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals and a District Judge of the 12th Judicial Circuit. President Obama appointed her to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in July 2014. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, Mr. Blue, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And Congressman Butterfield, uh, we're glad you're in North Carolina conducting this hearing. Uh, just quickly, in 1978, North Carolina had one of the lowest uh, black participating voting rates. Over the next 30 years, by 2008, North Carolina had one of the highest black participation rates in elections. And that was because of a series of laws that were enacted over that 30-year period uh, to encourage voting and to remove the obstacles uh, of to minority voting. Uh, and we were successful at it. One of the things that uh, uh, I've heard talk about, er, talked about earlier today was the monster law in 2013. I lived through it. I was in the Senate at the time. And it was designed to totally reverse the history that I just related to you. Uh, and it was aimed at all of those measures that we had taken over the previous 30 years to ensure participation and access to the ballot for all of the citizens of this state. Now, I would like to address briefly some fallout, uh, I think, from this whole discussion of, of, of Section 4, uh, because it relates also to the question of overall voter suppression. And I think that uh, uh, voter fraud has been uh, the basis upon which a lot of these laws have been enacted. Uh, in North Carolina, that, that is basically a non-starter. There is very little voting fraud uh, in North Carolina. Uh, the real issue uh, has been election fraud uh, in this state, uh, much more, I think, recently than, than voting fraud. Uh, uh, In-person in voting fraud has been a red herring from the beginning of the discussions uh, that I've heard uh, from the uh, early 80s forward. Uh, and it still is a red herring. An audit of votes in the 2016 general election found one case of in-person voter impersonation out of 4.8 million votes cast. One case. When Republicans uh, have amplified uh, the false narrative that in-person voter fraud is rampant, now we've discovered true election fraud, and you don't have a colleague representing the 9th Congressional District in North Carolina. Uh, that is the real challenge. Uh, balloting, ballot harvesting by political operatives compromised more than 2,500 votes in Robinson County uh, and Bladen counties in North Carolina. So it, it's the election fraud as opposed to the voter fraud that is the real challenge to us here. 
and we've been chasing uh, this problem that's not a problem. But to date, North Carolina General Assembly uh, passed yet another voter ID law claiming that it's going to prevent voter fraud. Uh, and nothing has gone on in a discussion of what we do about voter harvesting. The real cost of voter ID in the state, and we made this argument, uh, is that uh, this legislation uh, that was enacted last year, uh, this new amendment to our state constitution, puts a tremendous burden on the state and local boards of election. Uh, without the funding to back up these obligations, uh, then it makes access to the ballot even less likely. Uh, you've heard the testimony of the distances that people travel, but as importantly, uh, it will cost $17 million to implement a photo ID requirement without any funding having been provided specifically for that. Uh, the original fiscal note attached to the implementing legislation that was referred to only addressed voter fraud protection and not these other broad ranges of issues that are present in this discussion. While local boards of election are tasked with creating new photo IDs, we haven't given them the funding to do it. Now, voter suppression is also occurring through voter confusion, uh, which is another issue. Uh, the, the, the recent bill put the unnecessary burden on voters mandating that they must comply with new photo ID requirements at the polls in just five months from now. Five months from now, these are our local elections. And so we have a requirement for voter ID without any implementation for providing it. Of the 850 universities, colleges, government agencies, and tribes, only 72 applied uh, for, their voter, for their voter identification requirements to be approved. Among them, 12 of North Carolina's 17 uh, UNC system schools were rejected for failing to meet the statutory requirements. Of our UNC system schools, only North Carolina State, North Carolina Central, Elizabeth City State, Appalachian State, and UNC, UNC, UNC Asheville students will be allowed to use their voter IDs to vote. Voter ID is required in an election occurring less than a month from now. A bill to fix the problem has been introduced in the House, but uh, the, uh, the Republican leadership in the Senate said there's nothing to fix, so it goes on. This whole issue of voter suppression by way of confusing voters as to what ought to be required in order for them to vote. Thank you very much. Ms. Swain, you're recognized for five minutes. Hopefully you can hear me now. My name is Caitlin Swain, and I'm co-director of Forward Justice, a law policy and strategy center based in Durham, North Carolina, dedicated to advancing racial, social, and economic justice in the US South. It has been our privilege to serve as counsel uh, in several litigation efforts in North Carolina post Shelby, uh, uh, serving on behalf of the North Carolina NAACP. At For Justice, we know that when we enlarge the we in we, the people, we are stronger as a nation. When we expand that we, we rise to the higher call of our moral and constitutional dictates. Freedom from racial discrimination in voting is not a partisan value. It is how we measure the guarantee of our shared commitment to a free, fair, and inclusive democracy. Yet, in North Carolina and across the nation, our commitment to, perfect, to perfecting the union is in crisis. For the better part of a decade, shamefully, history is repeating itself. Post Shelby, as you've heard today and as this committee is well aware, North Carolina has infamously become the testing ground for a crushing avalanche of anti-voter and racially discriminatory voter suppression policies. As soon as protections were lifted, as detailed in my written testimony, and as the committee has already heard this morning, the General Assembly of North Carolina enacted the most comprehensive voter uh, suppression law seen since the Jim Crow era, targeting African American access to the ballot with what the Court of Appeals has termed surgical precision, eliminating same day registration, a week of early voting, the safeguard of out-of-precinct voting, and pre-registration of 16 and 17-year-olds. 
and also enacting one of the strictest discriminatory photo voter ID laws in the nation. We know that photo voter ID in North Carolina is a solution in search of a problem. While the North Carolina NAACP and many other plaintiffs, including 96-year-old Mother Rosanelle Eaton, who you heard about earlier this morning, ultimately succeeded in eliminating the law in historic litigation, untold damage was done in the three intervening years before uh, that decision came down and was ultimately uh, supported by the, North, by the U.S. Supreme Court. Right after the victory, uh, in 2016, as I detail in my written testimony, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the fight did not end. There are intersecting barriers to the right to vote at the local level, uh, including early voting um, uh, access issues that, that uh, Tomas Lopez uh, spoke about earlier today, uh, as well as uh, voter purge issues, which I have um, uh, uh, given uh, detailed information about. I'll speak to one of those uh, issues. On the eve of the 2016 election, during the 30 days before, the, uh, before election day, uh, a challenge was made to the registration of 100-year-old Grace Bell Hardison based on an unreturned mailing. Ultimately, uh, what we discovered in our investigation is that that challenge uh, was a part of a mass systematic removal strategy in this state. Again, while we were victorious in uh, uh, the ultimate litigation, uh, harm was done as we uh, continue to have to divert our resources toward litigation and away from uh, enfranchising voters. Access to the ballot should not be a party line decision. We all have a stake in returning dignity to our democracy and we know what works. And yet, as soon as uh, uh, the Supreme Court decision, uh, ultimately finding that you know, the North Carolina NAACP v. McCrory case would be law took place, the General Assembly uh, uh, leadership came forward and said that they would be pursuing a constitutional amendment to enshrine voter ID uh, in the North Carolina Constitution. And I just want to note, I, I, obviously we've spoken about this today, but a, a quote from the General Assembly leadership at that time, the Republican uh, General Assembly leadership, that the, that the goal was to mute future court challenges. We must restore the Voting Rights Act pre-clearance regime. We, uh, it is a uh, shameful, it is shameful here in North Carolina what voters have had to do to uh, uh, f have confidence in this democracy. I look forward to answering your questions as to specific uh, 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 concerns and I thank you for this uh, opportunity. I thank you as well. The Honorable Patricia Timmons Goodson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairwoman Fudge and Representative Butterfield, uh, thank you so very much for inviting me to appear today. I am Patricia Timmons Goodson. Thank you. I am Patricia Timmons Goodson, Vice Chair of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. And I come before you today to speak about our 2018 statutory enforcement report entitled, An Assessment of Minority Voting Rights Access in the United States. That report is available in full on the Commission's website. Congress has directed the Commission to annually examine federal civil rights enforcement efforts. Pursuant to that mandate, the Commission conducted a day-long briefing and public comment period in Raleigh, North Carolina in February of 2018. The decision to come to North Carolina was a bittersweet one for me. On the one hand, like Representative Butterfield, I delight in bringing visitors to my home state. On the other hand, I suspected that recent political and legislative changes would prevent North Carolina would present North Carolina 
in less than a favorable light. I understood that the visit was a must and in the best interest of our state. The day after uh, the Shelby County versus Holder decision, the General Assembly in North Carolina amended a pending bill to make its voter ID law stricter and added other provisions eliminating or restricting opportunities to vote that had been beneficial to minority voters, uh, as Senator Blue has shared earlier. Federal courts later found these actions in uh, North Carolina to be intentionally racially discriminatory after years of litigation. The commission, uh, after its hearing, unanimously voted for the following uh, key recommendations. Number one, that Congress should amend the Voting Rights Act to restore and or to expand protections against voting discrimination that are more streamlined and efficient than existing provisions of the act. Secondly, that in establishing the reach of an amended Voting Rights Act coverage provision, Congress should include current evidence of voting discrimination as well as evidence of historical and persisting patterns of discrimination. Uh, another rec key recommendation that a new coverage provision should account for evidence that voting discrimination tends to recur in certain areas. The commission heard from 33 members of the public uh, during our public comment period. Uh, let me quickly uh, share some of those comments. Um, there was a common refrain such as democracy works better when more people participate, a concerted, coordinated effort is underway to undermine democracy in North Carolina, and we heard, continue to hear about a monster piece of legislation uh, and that that was to blame. Um, just sharing snippets of, that, uh, of those public comments from Ms. Mary Elizabeth uh, Hanchi, um, she indicated that uh, we were drowning in North Carolina in artful barriers to access and that our, to access uh, the ballot and that our minority communities were particularly subject to these artful barriers. From Ajamu Dillahunt, uh, as he spoke of the monster law, he shared with us that racial gerrymandering prevented black political power through packing and, and as he said, cracking, and used uh, an example uh, of the General Assembly splitting um, a precinct in the historically uh, black college at A&T down the middle. One part of the campus was in one district and um, the other part in another uh, part of the district. Uh, and I'm going to submit the uh, transcript uh, from that hearing. As you will see from the transcripts and the small snippets of North Carolina voting rights stakeholders that I just shared, there is growing and continuous concern for the voting rights of Americans. The distressing data from our report further adds to the urgency of Congress to restore and or expand voter protections. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. And with your report, um, with no objection, we will enter it in the record so ordered. Thank you, we will begin with our questions. Uh, Mr. Butterfield. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for yielding time to me. Thank you. First of all, let me acknowledge that all three of you are lawyers, and so that's uh, very helpful to us. Uh, while we are interested in, uh, in history and what happened during Reconstruction and the antebellum era, and I'm guilty of it as well, uh, we're trying to create a contemporary record that would be valuable and, and relevant uh, in the inquiry that, that we are engaged in. And so thank you for speaking uh, to contemporary issues that, that uh, are present here in, in North Carolina. Uh, we were in, uh, as I mentioned, North Dakota uh, Tuesday of this week. It's interesting to know that North Dakota does not have voter registration. I didn't know that before I got there, but they do not have voter registration. Uh, you just show up on election day and you vote. 
but the fact of the matter is that after the Shelby uh, decision was made, the state uh, came up with a voter ID requirement in North Dakota. Uh, prior to that, the communities were so small that the community uh, natives could identify every person who came through the bowling, polling place because they were all friends. But after uh, Shelby, uh, they had this voter requirement, uh, voter ID requirement. But, but the problem that, that we had to encounter was that uh, there are Indian reservations uh, in North and South Dakota uh, where the Native Americans do not have street addresses. They have P.O. boxes. That's, that's their culture. Uh, and so they were being prohibited from uh, casting their, their vote and, and being able to participate. And so um, your testimony today is, is very helpful. Let, let me start with you, uh, Senator Blue, and, and again, thank you. Uh, you and I have been friends for 105 years, 110 years, but, it, but it's good to, to see you again. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, Senator, uh, between September 2016 and May of 2018, uh, North Carolina purged 11 percent of its voter rolls. Just 19 of its counties purged fewer than 10 percent of their voters. No county purged fewer than 8 uh, percent. These purges have been especially troubling for voters of color. In 90 out of 100 counties, voters of colors, color were overrepresented among the purged group. Uh, can you shed any light on, on that? Why has North Carolina purged so many voters? Well, part, part of uh, the, the challenge is, and again, uh, you, you, you're familiar with the federal court decision prior to the last election. Uh, that stopped the purge uh, somewhere in the middle district. I forget exactly which county. Uh, maybe it was in Cumberland County or either Forsyth County. But uh, nevertheless, th there are more dependable ways to determine where someone is now. And simply mailing a postcard, whether it's one of those post office boxes in uh, South Dakota, or mailing it uh, to someone that you know is mobile, uh, and determining that as a sole reason to purge someone is not a way to do it in 2021, uh, in, in, in 2020 rather. You can find out where someone is using much more modern techniques now rather than just sending a postcard to find out uh, whether they've moved if they haven't voted in the last two presidential elections. So I think a lot of it is updating uh, our way of determining one's whereabouts using modern technology rather than uh, 400 year old technology. Sometimes uh, even modern technology has its flaws. I had a witness in North Dakota who said that they came up with a scheme that you call 911 if you didn't have a street address and the technology would identify your location. And they identified this fellow's location as a liquor store, uh, which is obviously where he didn't, didn't live. Uh, but, but anyway, to, uh, to you, uh, Caitlin Swain, thank you. Um, let's talk about preclearance for a second. Uh, you know, I. Um, I practiced voting rights law for a very short period of time, and even I did not recognize in the beginning the power and effectiveness of Section 5 preclearance. It was a powerful tool until it was suspended by the court. It was essentially uh, at no cost. The burden of proof was on the jurisdiction seeking to obtain a, a, a change in election procedure, and the jurisdiction had the obligation to submit the data and the the request to the Department of Justice for preclearance. Sometimes there was preclearance, sometimes there was not preclearance, but there was no cost associated with it, and it was very effective if you had a fair Department of Justice. Uh, on the other hand, Section 2, which was the, the, the provision that we used here in this county, very expensive. Uh, when I uh, did it years ago, it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, and now I suspect it's in the millions of dollars uh, to fully litigate a Section 2 claim without preclearance. The time and expense of protecting the right to vote has increased. Litigation can be costly. Sometimes lawsuits can't be decided very quickly. Uh, so my question is, can you des describe the sorts of resources that are necessary to litigate voting cases? Where does this money come from? Uh, absolutely, Congressman Butterfield. Yeah. And, and, and I'm running out of time, so if you could, you know, truncate your, your response. Yes. I'd, I'd be happy to. Yeah. Uh, for in, in the Section 2 litigation that we've spoken about today, uh, the, the um, council uh, altogether estimated more than $10 million 
uh, of costs uh, uh, just on the plaintiff's side. Uh, that was close to doubled when you also include nonprofit groups uh, estimates of, of the cost that we took on as well as uh, the state's cost in bringing in private uh, counsel to represent the governor uh, as well as the General Assembly. All of those costs are borne disproportionately by the taxpayers of uh, of, of this state now, uh, as well as uh, by the, uh, uh, as well as a, a, a non uh, 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 monetary cost, which is that the burden is on the voters now, uh, and, and I, I've, I have detailed that. And Ms. Timmons Goodson, if you would give an addendum to that, has the loss of preclearance made it more difficult to track these changes at the local level that could have that could have a discriminatory effect? It absolutely from, from the Civil Rights Commission perspective? Um, from the Civil Rights uh, Commission's perspective, it certainly has made tracking more difficult. Um, at one point, uh, there was a single source or a limited number of places that we could go to get the information, but when it's left to individual citizens and organizations to um, do the filing, it makes it far more difficult to track them. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, thank you. Uh, before we go any further, I was asked a question by someone in the audience about if the audience could ask questions. This is a, an official congressional hearing, so it does not allow for audience participation by way of asking questions, just so that you would know that we're not ignoring you. It just happens to be an official, an official hearing. Um, Senator Blue, now I was talking to some of my sorority sisters last night and they were telling me how the state legislature some few years back did everything they could to make it difficult for educators and the young people they educate by changing lots of rules. Uh, now I see that they are making it difficult for people to vote. What do your colleagues say uh, if they are ever asked, what is it that they have against hardworking people or against poor people uh, <coughs> or against people who just want to participate and have their rights? What, what do they say? They don't say, Congresswoman. Uh, it, it's just that uh, their belief is that fewer people who vote, uh, the better their chances for sustaining themselves. Uh, that's what we experienced in the redistricting uh, in, in, in the thought that the more people that I exclude from it, uh, the more regressive the policies I adopt are, and they're not able to do anything to me about that. I think that uh, Dr. Barber described it pretty, pretty, pretty adequately when you put extra burdens on people who are already overburdened, uh, then they're going to have to make choices as to what they choose to do. And so they will choose not to vote uh, if it's more difficult, if you've got to spend money uh, to go vote. The, the question that uh, Congressman Butterfield asked me about uh, the purging, if in fact you know that uh, the poorer people are less likely to own their homes and are more likely to rent. They're going to be moving to different places, different apartments and stuff, and they're more subject to being purged. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, there's data that backs that up, and so they look at that as they make the decisions. It's not a desire to get 100% represented democracy. Uh, it's a desire on their part, at least as I see it, to get uh, representation for the people who agree with them and not the people who might have a different experience or a different idea as to how government ought to operate. You know, it's interesting to me, and GK said that we are all lawyers. Uh, the Constitution doesn't say you can only vote if you didn't, if, if, if you vote in every election. It didn't say that if you skip a two or three that you can't vote. The Constitution doesn't say that. The Constitution says you have an unabridged, unfettered right to vote. So I really believe that purging is unconstitutional. And for all of those who constantly want to recite the Constitution and talk about First Amendment and read it when we start Congress, they really don't care anything about the Constitution. Because if they did, they would make it easier for people to vote and not harder. Um, <laughs> Ms. Timmons Goodson, when you prepare reports as the one that you have described to us, where does that report go? I mean, is there a congressional uh, committee that you make that you testify in front of or what happens to those reports? Uh, yes. The commission, upon deciding uh, the issue that we're going to examine, um, commences to bring together 
experts uh, in and on a particular issue. So those experts may come from government, uh, may come from um, the academy, may be regular citizens, and they testify much as we're doing here today. This, the report that uh, was filed uh, in connection with voting rights represented our statutory report. By law, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights must submit to Congress and the President at least one report uh, each year. And so the voting rights um, was our, our uh, issue for um, the year. So a copy was sent to uh, the President and um, to the leaders of Congress and um, when I say leaders, I'm talking about the leadership. And then uh, we make available to other members uh, of Congress a copy uh, of the report. I I'm going to ask you all the same question I've asked on every panel. Uh, because we are responsible for federal elections. Obviously, sometimes they overlap. But if there was something that you would believe that the federal government could do to assist in making elections fairer, in North Carolina, what would it be? And I'll just start and go straight down the line. Senator? I will give you two quick uh, suggestions. One uh, would be for uh, the, the, the Congress to weigh in on this whole question of redistricting. Uh, I mean, you do have the power and authority to determine what federal elections look like. Uh, and if you set the model using federal elections, I think that the states mostly will follow. Uh, secondly, Congress can weigh in to make it easier for people to vote. When we started early voting, same day registration and all of those, they were designed to make it easier for people to vote. Because in interviewing people across the state and in representing people across the state, uh, they couldn't get off for work on election day. And if you're in rural North Carolina, for the most part where I grew up, you were encouraged not to vote and you were penalized if you did. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that Congress could engage uh, in the discussion of, uh, of election day itself. Uh, if, if we are probably one of the few uh, advanced societies is, that does not recognize mm -hmm. election day uh, as a holiday, as a day that everybody can take off to go vote. Now, if you got ample one-stop voting or early voting, you don't have to do it. But you got to have three, four weeks of early voting in order to offset this one-day vote uh, so that people can express themselves. Thank you. Ms. Swain. Thank you. In addition to reinstating the preclearance regime, which we've spoken about uh, today, I have two further recommendations. Uh, one is, uh, as is included in HR 1, in, uh, invest in incentives for state investment in voting infrastructure, uh, voter modern modernization efforts, and expanding access to the ballot at the state level. So that would be federal uh, incentives for, to, to uh, uh, make those changes. Secondly, uh, to, uh, ex we believe that we must expand the right to vote uh, to include those disenfranchised based on criminal convictions uh, in this country. Uh, in North Carolina, this is a vestige of the 1900 white supremacy campaign uh, 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 in the state, uh, the, the uh, constitutional amendment creating uh, felony disenfranchisement uh, uh, was the same that created the literacy test. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Congress does have a role to play in this, though, it, though these are also state-based laws. Uh, and uh, I believe that that is also included in the current version of HR1. We would endorse that here in North Carolina. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Timmons Goodson. Yes, um, and I concur uh, fully in the suggestions that have been put forth uh, thus far and um, would not have any additional ones to add to that. Well, I thank you all for uh, your testimony, and I thank the audience for being here. Um, I want to thank our staff for the work that they've done uh, to make sure that this come out. Basically, all I do is come and sit down. They do all the work. So I want to thank them for the work that they are doing. I, as well, would like to thank Halifax Community College for hosting us today. Um, and with that, I would thank my colleague, from, uh, who is your representative and a good one at that, uh, this hearing is adjourned.
And if you all could come up so we can take a photograph as well.